Proverbs 17, 22. This is a proverb that I've been extra familiar with for years because Vicki and I learned a song, a little song, that is pretty much word for word this proverb many years ago when our children were very young. And it helps you to remember very much. And <clears throat> Verse 22 says this, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Now the word merry is joyful. We know what merry means, merry Christmas, joyful. A joyful heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Another way to say dries up the bones is withers the strength. It depletes you. It sucks the strength out of you. If you've ever wondered whether stress and grief, mental anguish affects you physically or not, there's no doubt about that. It very much does, and probably more than just about anything. Your heart, in this sense, and spirit, are not physical parts of you. The heart here is not the, the uh, internal organ that pumps your blood. And of course, the spirit. These are not physical parts of you. But the bones are. The bones are. And medicine works on the body. Even medicines that are for mental troubles or disorders are helping those things by some physical effect on your body. A chemical adjustment of some kind or whatever it is. It's a physical thing. So we have the two tied together here, the spiritual and the physical. You have a direct relationship between the two with regard to health and well-being. And notice, first of all, that it doesn't work the other way. It's good to take care of your body. It's good to eat the right things and to exercise and to, in, in a healthy way and, and uh, even take vitamins. Getting some sun, I think, is important, getting out. But those things won't help your spirit. It won't hurt it. And I'm not saying that it won't have some good effect on your attitude and even relieve stress maybe to do some physical things. But that's still physical. It's physical exercise having a positive physical effect. It's, it, it results in mental, but it's doing something physical to your body. Endorphins, I, I'm not an expert on all that, whatever it is, that causes you to feel better in, in a mental way too but it won't cure a broken spirit no the great physician knows us really well that's one of the most important things about a doctor I feel it's important and, and y'all know how I feel about doctors generally speaking but if you're going to have one and you are sooner or later, get to know them, and more importantly, have them get to know you. Our great physician knows us very well. The one who knit us together in our mother's womb prescribes something that only he can perform, a work of grace on the heart. A joyful heart is a heart that's given by God. And a joyful heart is not, uh, in our text this morning, just describing someone that's happy-go-lucky and through life. 
And uh, I think that may have some medical benefit as well. But the sinner has a great need, and it's a spiritual need. It starts with the spirit, doesn't it? And everything else is affected. The heart of man by nature is sick. Isaiah 1 5, why should you be stricken anymore? The whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint or weak or sick. God opened Lydia's heart, and He's the only one that can do that. And I want us to notice, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 16. You know, you hear that quoted a lot. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. What does that mean? What for? What what did it do? Do you remember before you turn over there? The result of God opening her heart? Acts 16, 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of... Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. If you're even going to hear a word I say this morning, God has to do a work on your heart. Spiritual things are not like earthly things. God has got to operate on your heart. And when he opened her heart, she heard the gospel that Paul preached, the gospel of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how God, by grace through faith in the person of Christ, saves sinners like her. And she didn't want them to leave. She was happy. She rejoiced in that message. Turn with me back to Acts, if you're still in Acts 16, there, Acts, Acts 13. Let's look at Acts 13, 44, and I think this will help us to see something, too. Again, it will confirm what we just read, that the Lord opens the heart, and then this has everything to do with the gospel, with the, the word preached by God's messenger, the Apostle Paul in this case. But look at uh, Acts 13 and verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. What a terrible thing. That's a condition of the heart too, isn't it? They, you know, they're, they're, everybody's gathering together to hear the, the word of God preached and they saw the crowds and they're saying, we don't get crowds like that. That was their reaction. Instead of rejoicing or just being interested enough to not be thinking foolish things like that. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now these are the religious Jews. These are the ones that supposedly spoke for God. But you see, the ones that supposedly speak for God, what they say contradicts what we say. It's not just a little different idea about some things. It's not just a a different brand of gospel. It's a false gospel. They contradict what we say. We say salvation is by grace alone. That God just saves sinners because he wants to. They say grace is God giving you a chance. (laughs) That's a contradiction. Grace is either God saving you or it's him allowing you to save yourself if you will. It can't be both. It's a contradiction. We preach that Christ, the son of God, when he sheds his precious blood to save a sinner, he saves that sinner. They don't preach that. They contradict that, blaspheming by saying that Christ's blood is just as effective for everybody as it is for anybody. 
That's blasphemy. They're still doing it. They're still contradicting us. They're still blaspheming. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. In other words, it ticked them off. (laughs) They came there to preach the gospel and these idiots are saying the opposite. They're undermining the truth of God. And they said, hold on a second here. They didn't come here. These people didn't come here to hear you. He said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. That's just a nice way of saying bug off. We have no use for you. (laughs) Not going to preach to you anymore. Done with you. If you want to openly reject and oppose and blaspheme the gospel of Christ, you're not welcome. (laughs) For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. <laughs> they had a completely different attitude. It was, the, it was what God did in their heart. The Lord opened their heart that they didn't gripe about or, or oppose what was being preached. They listened to it. And it made them glad. But you know how I know that? It wasn't just that Paul was favoring the Gentiles. They might have just been, yeah, you Jews get out of here. You know, this is our show. Look at the next word. They glorified the word of the Lord, not themselves. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. (laughs) And you can't read that any other way. You can't reverse that. It doesn't say as many as believed were ordained unto eternal life. It says those whom God had chosen from before the foundation of the world to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, they believed. It's just the opposite of what he told those Jews in John chapter 10. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. These ones did believe because they were his sheep. It is this rejoicing, this gladness that our text is talking about. There's nothing else like it. This is joy. How does the scripture describe it? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable. If somebody asks you, what is it that, that, you know, about that church? That's what they'd say when it's, the gospel that we rejoice in. But they'd say, what is it about that church that you know makes you so happy that you couldn't explain it to them? There's no way. You can't speak it. You can't, they're gonna have to experience it for themselves. The forgiveness of sin. <laughs> Having the Son of God, he that hath the Son. How are you going to explain that to somebody that doesn't have the son? Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. David, it says, and when, when he was at the bottom, encouraged himself in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 3, 3, for we are the circumcision, that is, we are the covenant people of God. Circumcision was the symbol of the covenant, which worship God in the spirit. That's where the, the healing takes place. And it affects everything you are, everything you do, everything you say, everything you think. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. 
and have no confidence in the flesh. What do you need when you're sick? What, what would you say when your body is physically sick? You get the flu or whatever it is. What does everybody say, really? Even doctors, they'll say the most important thing is what? Rest. And then you go in the hospital and the last thing you can do is rest. So that's another story. Oh, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Keyword, soul. What is it that we need? Matthew 9, verses 1 and 2. Just close with this final thought. This is so interesting that this man, the, his friends were so determined that the Lord should bless him. I tell you what, they couldn't, they couldn't force the Lord to, to bless their paralyzed friend, but they were going to find out whether he would or not. <laughs> if it killed them all, they were going to find out whether he would. They were going to get him in front of them, in front of him. He entered into a ship, the Lord Jesus, and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And we know from other accounts of this what they went through to get that man in front of the Lord. And here he is. What, what's his need? Well, he's paralyzed. He's so sick that he can't even move. And what's the remedy? Your sins are gone. And notice the Lord said, be of good cheer. Not be of good cheer. I'm going to give you all your strength back. If he had stayed on that bed the rest of his life, he could have still been merry in his heart because his sins were gone. <laughs> That's what we need. And it affects everything else, doesn't it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray together.